Next, we're going to make the spindles. There are seven of them, and you're going to make them all at 23 inches long. This is where we're going, but this is how we're beginning. Obviously, a lot of work to be done to this piece to make it look like this. There are also several operations that have to be done to each spindle. My suggestion is you do an, one operation and then repeat it on the remaining six spindles. Then move on to the second operation and again repeat it on all six spindles. And you'll find that that's a more efficient way to work than to begin jumping back and forth between operations. The first step will be to get this spindle blank to 7 8 inches square along its entire length. Once again, the inker stick is my gauge. It's 7 8 in this dimension, so I, but it's, 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 it's more than 7 8 here. So I will take my draw knife and get it down to dimension. Yeah, that did it. Another tip, if you want to run your spindle blanks through your thickness planer and make them all 7 8 that may help too. Now, the next step will be to round this spindle to, to, so that it passes through a 7 8 inch gauge. I'm going to do that to two-thirds of the spindle. So I'm measuring up about two-thirds, and that's the operative word about. You don't have to be precise with any of these. And again, notice how much easier this is to do in a vise than in a shave horse. Now it's the 7 8 inch hole. I switch to a spoke shave because it gives me just a bit more control than the draw knife. And again, in the go gauge, by looking down the spindle, the go gauge will show you your high spots, the places where you need to shave. That's the first operation. The go gauge only has to pass to the halfway point. I started at two thirds, but I only really have to go to the halfway point. If I overshoot as I did in this case, that's not a problem. But I need to test with the hole to the halfway point. After having taken all seven spindle blanks to this stage, I'm ready to move on with the second operation. Now I'm going to grip the round end and starting at the two thirds from this end, I'm going to make this length of the spindle into one half inch square.
Now I don't have a half inch dimension on my Incra stick, so I can just quickly measure with my tape measure. And there we go, I'm half inch square, ready to start rounding. I'm going to do the same thing on this end that I did here. I'm going to round the corners, knock off the corners, then use a spoke shave and pass this through a half inch hole. half inch hole in the go gauge. I'm going to fit into the spindle. And there we go. Second step is done. Now again, the go gauge does not have to go the full two thirds, only about halfway. And what you see is the spindle is beginning to take shape. It's a little bit heavier than this spindle, this finished spindle, because it's going to be fitted to the chair uh, later on as we're working on the back. Do that now with all seven of your spindle blanks. When you're done, we'll move on to the next operation. Having completed the second operation on all seven spindle blanks, we're move, ready to move on to the third step. The third step will be to make this shaft, the lower shaft of the spindle, five eighths of an inch in diameter. That occurs over about five inches and it, it creates this swelling right here. This is where that seven inch line comes in on your anchor stick. What it does is center that swelling. I will start at it and create the lower shaft. Now, this lower shaft will also have the tenon that goes into the seat. The tenon's 9 16 This is 5 8 That gives us just a bit of a shoulder. Now, your inclination might be to test the end of the spindle through a 5 8 inch hole. Don't. If it'll pass through a 5 8 inch hole, it's already smaller than 5 8 and you won't have the shoulder that you're going to need. So instead of checking with the go gauge, testing with the go gauge, we're going to test with the 5 8 inch uh, dimension on the Incra stick, which we lay on the end of the spindle like this. And you can just slide your fingers and you can feel, as I can, that I'm just a whisker heavy, enough for me to be able to clean up with my spoke shape. There we go, and you can see the spindles beginning to take shape. You now can set these aside, and we'll move on to 
the assembly of the chair. We'll be doing more work on the spindles later, but for now, this is the condition that you need to have them in, all seven. We established when we were legging up that round hole, round tenon is not a permanent joint. At that point, we learned that if we want to take advantage of the speed and the ease with which a round hole, round tenon joint can be made, we can't rely on glue alone. We have to incorporate some mechanical feature that will survive after the glue has failed and keep the joint together permanently. The ends of the spindles are connected to the seat and we have to incorporate again some mechanical property that will keep them together after the glue fails. The joint we're going to use is one of the slickest in woodworking. Its concept is similar to square peg round hole. We made the end of the spindles 5 eighths inch in diameter. What we're going to do is make very pronounced facets on the end of the tenon so that the distance between the points remains 5 eighths. But these gaps will allow the hole to distort and conform to the end of the tenon so that uh, uh, we don't split the seat even though we're driving a tenon into the hole that's bigger than the hole. The way we're going to to do this is with a rounded tenon like this. And then facets like this and we'll be able to drive it up to the tenon so that the um, the spindle looks like it's organic and growing out right out of the seat. There won't be any evidence of the shoulder. This is a sample of this drive fit tenon joint. I made this 25 years ago to show the joint to students in my classes. And then I cut it apart so that we can look inside and see the result. And close up, you can see how the faceted tenon driven into the round hole has distorted the hole, making it take the shape of the tenon. This is 25 years old and it hasn't loosened yet. This is the technique for making those faceted tenons. You don't have to measure the tenons. This is a 35 millimeter number three sweep gouge. 35 millimeter is like inch and three eighths. So just a little under gives me my inch and a quarter tenons. Then I hold the gouge against my sternum and I pull straight back. And each time I do that, I create a chip that's both uniform in width and in thickness. And what it leaves behind a pronounced facets. Now, this is going to be driven into a slightly undersized hole, so I'm going to round the end of the tenon to ease its beginning, its entry. And then I place it in the chair. When I work on large numbers of parts like spindles, I try not to co-mingle them when I'm done, but to work from a to-do pile and then put the finished piece in a done pile. In this case, my done pile is the chair because that's where I'm going to be using the spindles next. And so I continue to make those faceted tenons. Okay, that's the last of the long spindles, and now we're going to deal with the shorts. The shorts come with a little cookie on them that has to be cut off. And the great thing about these shoulders, or these tenons, is they already have 
shoulders turned on them. So all you have to do is facet that egg. And it's done the same way. Nice pronounced facets. There you go, and we'll do that four times. Okay, we're ready now to locate the holes in the, uh, uh, the arm rail. Notice that by putting all the spindles in place I, and pushing them in so they begin to take the angle of the holes, I'm able to test them and the results look very promising. I need to start with the center hole walking off my spindles from there. And I have to be sure that that spindle is at a right angle to the seat. And so I have a device I'm going to use to do that. But before I begin, I want to make sure I'm tight because if the arm is loose when I locate that point and then I tighten up the chair afterwards, it's all going to get pulled to one side or the other. This device is really simple. It's two framing squares hinged together. And if I set the center of this square in the center of the hole, and then this leg along the short axis, the center line of the chair, there's my 90 degrees. And so I make that mark right there. Now I walk off the spindles. And according to the dimension sheet, the distance between long spindles is 2 and 5 eighths inches. That number is carved in stone. It cannot be changed. If you do, you have no guarantee that the bow is going to go on to the spindles. So 2 and 5 eighths cannot be changed. So I set my dividers to 2 and 5 eighths inches. I prefer to start at the two and extend to four and five eighths. It's more accurate than if I start at the end. And notice that I don't make a mark, I draw a line. And you're going to see why later on. And once again, I put the spindles in place, make sure that they will align with those holes. I can't drive them all the way down, but I can push them in enough so they take the angle of the hole. Now it looks all, looks very believable. Now we're going to do the short spindles. And remember what I said, everything about short spindles is different. We line our short spindles using this corner where the, the scroll of the hand pen, uh, comes into the, the arm. And it's about three quarters of an inch behind that location. And again, I'll push the spindles in to make sure that they will uh, uh, work in that placement, and they do. Now, all we've gone through with the arm rail to balance it, uh, to make it so that it works on this chair, it's a fairly safe bet that this distance from here to here and this distance from here to here on the other side are not the same. So we're not going to walk off the second of the short spindles, we're going to use it to divide that space in half. This distance right here, we'll use it to divide it in half. 
And there's not really a lot of reason to measure it. If it looks good to you, it'll look good to everyone else. So there we go. We've got all our, our, our spindles located. Now, we're going to be drilling these holes at 16 degrees. And there's a problem in doing that that I need to uh, illustrate for you. This is the problem with drilling a 7 16 hole through a 7 8 inch wide arm rail at 16 degrees. If I center the hole, I'll blow out the front edge. So the solution is to bias the hole toward the rear of the arm rail. If I do that, I get maximum strength by having the same amount of continuous wood fibers in front of and behind the hole. This distance is 5 16 of an inch. We'll set a compass to the and running it along the back edge, locate that distance. In order to avoid the problem I just showed you of blowing out the front edge of the arm rail, I'm going to offset my hole slightly toward the rear of the chair. So I've just set a compass to 5 16 of an inch. And I will use that to scribe an X so now I have a line going front to back and one going side to side like crosshairs in a telescope that's where I'm going to start my holes Notice I don't do the same with the short spindles because everything about short spindles is different. Now we're ready to drill our holes in the arm rail. Thank you for watching this content. I hope you enjoyed it. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to this channel. And check back frequently for more Windsor chair making tips and tutorials.